Okay, we're back for the two o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about leadership in Hawaii. We're talking more specifically about transportation and trade, import export for Hawaii with Russell Hanma. He is the U.S. senior official for APEC Hawaii. Welcome back to the show, Russell. Okay, thank you, Jay, for welcoming today. Uh, I know that when I spoke last time, it was on the Vietnam issue, uh, Vietnam hosting an APEC conference in this November. So. Uh, but today I would like to talk about how it affects not only the policy side, but in terms of moving goods and service, what actually happens in terms of operation. As you know, when you're doing import-export, you have to uh, ship goods, and that includes ocean uh, shipping and air cargo shipping. So like in Hawaii, uh, we have like Mapson, we have Pasha, we have uh, foreign uh, steamship companies like K-Line or uh, Mitsui, Mar Mitsui Shipping Company that has a lot of port of entry here with the State Department, the Harbors di uh, Division. So they have to pay their wharfage fees every time they do the docking. And well, if they bring the in foreign carriers have a have a, a hard road to hoe because they can only go, they can only go between the foreign port in Hawaii and back and forth. But they can't, they, under the Jones Act, they can't go to the mainland U.S. in that same trip. Yeah, exactly. Because you know what the Jones Act calls for is have to be built and manufactured, the vessel itself have to be built and manufactured in the U.S. soil using American labor or American union. On top of that, when you, if it's American flag carrier from one port to the next port, for example, from Los Angeles port to Honolulu port, it, you got to use the American carrier uh, in this case. So I know that, you know, there's been a lot of talks about changing the Jones Act because it's been so old, you know, it's been since 1920s. That's uh, 100 years old. Exactly. So I know that like uh, a lot of these foreign carriers as well with uh, foreign investors or even uh, American uh, commerce as well because uh, some of these vessels are manufactured in, in China now and the, what they're trying to do with the Jones Act maybe 25 percent can be manufactured like using the Chinese labor or our, our, our skill that they have. And I know like even now, the U.S. Uh, Navy uh, is building their ships in China. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, because the labor and the steel price is a lot cheaper there. But you know, Maybe they're not subject to the Jones Act the way commercial shipping is. Huh? Yeah, I think in those kind of aspects. And you know, as you know, that with our new president, Donald Trump, he wants to make America great again by using American labor, bringing manufacturing back. So I don't think this Jones Act, well, like changing the Jones a, Act, is going to work this time. A, a this laughing stock in terms of ships, because we only, we have only one or two shipyards that are capable of building a, a significant ocean, uh, you know, uh, ocean cargo ship, and and uh, or for that matter, an ocean liner for cruising, um, and um, I, I think they're both in the South. Um, they build a, an average of one or two ships a year. It's, it's peanuts. Um, and these guys, the unions there and those shipyards, are effectively, through the Jones Act, they're blocking American um, shipping interests from using ships built overseas. So the result is you pay something like five times uh, what a ship would cost uh, in Korea uh, if you have it built in one of those shipyards here. And the result is it stymies American shipping. And so that's a, a question I put to you. Mm -hmm. You know, let's assume for a moment that it's true. We're stymieing American shipping. And Matson pays five times as much as it needs to pay for a ship. And, and the, the, the amortized cost of that extra hundreds of millions of dollars, we have to pay. It's, it's passed right along to us here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, one of the reasons why it's so expensive to buy, a, you know, a carton of milk. So my question is, you know, can we change that? And if we do change it, what happens? Uh, if you look at it, I know that there's a lot of movement within, in, from a congressional point of view, even from the state of Hawaii. I think each state nationwide has uh, brought this issue about the Jones Act. And it's not like it happened overnight, but uh, we've been Our delegation it, yeah, is not been supporting a change in the Jones Act, Russell. Yeah, I know that, uh, we, you know, because in, in Hawaii's case, I don't think it's going to affect us as much because we don't have too much of a shipment coming in from uh, Asia or in terms of drop shipment. And as you know, a lot, uh, lo lot of the ship that comes from uh, Asia is like through K-Line or, or could be uh, Mitsui Line or even uh, Korea has uh, Hanjin. Hanjin well, what is are they bringing? They're bringing China stuff has from their Asia? Own little air, uh, 
Oh, what, what are they bringing company. to us, those foreign lines? What are they bringing here? Well, actually, if you look at it, uh, a lot of it is made in China stuff or made in a Asia products or made in Japan stuff or made in Korea stuff that we consume here in Hawaii. Uh, a lot of a uh, country of origin uh, uh, because of the manufactured, you know, manufactured good. goods. That, you know, if you look at Hawaii, 98% of all the goods that we consume here are brought in, either from the mainland or from Asia. Because we don't manufacture Yeah, anything. we don't have anything here. Only thing that we may have is like our produce that we consume here, or because uh, we don't have a coal or uh, manufacture industry to produce steel for having a manufacturer. So, you know, Hawaii being a uh, isolated location in the middle of the Pacific, so we have to rely on shipping. Shipping is very important, like, you know, the State Department of Transportation. I used to be with the State Department of Transportation. I was a statewide uh, planner, so I know what the, uh, the ramification of the shipping and is very crucial here. We have to maintain our, our, our port here as well with our airport mm -hmm. uh, with the tourists that comes mm -hmm. here. And in terms of import-export, uh, I would say 97% of the goods that we consume are brought in by ocean. Maybe I would say 1% or 1.5% might be from air cargo and uh, that a lot of the airlines that we have. And you know, even the airlines, uh, we have a contract between signatory air and non-signatory. And when you do, like the airports uh, have their, uh, when I was there, we have to have the landing agreement uh, with each airline, because each airline has a, a agreement with <coughs> each state department uh, airports division. You know what I'm thinking throughout. though, is that you remember you know, when we studied social studies and history back in school, that the shipping, international shipping, global shipping began like in 16th, 17th century with these um, trips where the ship would carry stuff from point A to point B and then different stuff from point B back to A. Or, or in the triangle, the Bermuda Triangle, uh, carry stuff from point A to point B, from, then from stuff from B to point C, and then other stuff from C to back to A. The result is, you know, that you had an efficiency going and the ship owner could make a profit that way because he was always carrying something. Uh, you know, the, uh, what do you call it, the deadheading when you don't have anything on board, that's, that's just expense without mm -hmm. revenue. And so ship owners don't like to do that. So, for example, if I give you a ship, uh, one of those uh, international carriers you mentioned, coming from Asia and bringing manufactured goods from China, Japan, what have you, Korea, to the to the to Hawaii, okay. A, uh, they can't pick up anything in Hawaii to go to the mainland and vice versa because of the Jones Act. And B, um, there's nothing here. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's nothing here for them to take back to Asia. Nothing. I mean, we have such a, a, a sparsity of agricultural products now. Used to be we were sending agricultural products everywhere. We don't have an agricultural industry to speak of. We're not exporting anything that I can think of. You know, moo-moos, for example, you know, we don't export. We don't make them here. We bring them in. We don't send them out. Um, so, I, you know, going back to that old Bermuda Triangle kind of analogy, what happens? It's got to be more expensive. That the goods they bring in on the leg from Asia to here have got to cost more because they're deadheading back from here to Asia. Am I right? Yeah, I think in terms of a cost, and uh, if you look at the value of uh, uh, the goods that's being brought in, uh, you know, like Hawaii, where, you know, basically, like you said, if they're going back, the steamship company or air, air cargo people that's coming in, most of the air cargo is under, done on the commercial airplanes that comes in. Are, uh, they have their own little cargo, so what they do is they have the LD3s or LD7 pallet that mm -hmm. has a different size. Like if you go to ocean carriers, you have your 20-foot container, 40-foot container. The 40-foot containers are the large container that's used with the truck, with the piggyback style, have a flat bed. With, and uh, you see it around the freeway in delivery throughout the airports or throughout the uh, ocean cargo areas. So they are with doing their delivery orders from the U.S. Customs. When they clear Customs, mm -hmm. they have to go and clear, uh, pick up their merchandise. So what the custom brokers do is usually they look at a uh, classification, valuation, liquidation process. For classification, you have to classify what kind of item you're importing in. And valuation is what value, based on the invoice or pro forma invoice or the shipping list, there's a value. Is it FOB price 
Is it uh, CIF, cost insurance freight? Is it prepaid or collect cost? Remember these terms from law school. Yeah, oh, exactly. Boy. So uh, you got to kind of uh, take it, you know, case by case where what country of origin the shipments are coming yeah, in. But am I right about my analysis? If, if you bring it in and you have nothing to bring back, then the cost to the consumer on the imported goods is going to be higher because the ship owner needs to make his expenses. He has to pay his expenses coming and going, but he really only has cargo in one direction. Mm -hmm. And so the result is, you know, we, uh, the consumers who pay for that cargo, you know, to consume that cargo, we're paying for, a, you know, at yeah, the I think end, so. Yeah, if you look the, at the, the both sides of mm -hmm. the trip. Yeah, if you look at it, uh, for depending on what commodities or goods that we're consuming, if you look at the Asian goods that we're consuming, it could be the, our Sony Walkmans or TVs, VCRs or some of these uh, products, the food stuff that we bring in from China, South Korea, or Japan, that uh, or the shipping oil. and the or shipping oil from Indonesia. Yeah, and the shipping company they have their own little freight forwarders, and they use their own little uh, steamship companies. And these steamship company that comes from Asia are usually foreign steamship companies or steam. Uh, so, in other words, uh, the Jones Act will apply. So they cannot go and do a drop shipment from Indonesia, bring in oil. Or from Japan, they're bringing a lot of these electronics goods you here. Can't stop it to and American ports. Exactly, and if you do a drop ship in Honolulu, then go to Los Angeles or San Francisco or Seattle, uh, it's not American carrier with American flags. So, so let's that, dwell on that a for a minute. So that don't you think that Hawaii would be better off if there were no Jones Act, or if it, Hawaii was exempted from the effect of the Jones Act? Um, this is just one question. And, and uh, it's what I was saying before, is that a ship made in the United States costs five times what a ship costs made in Korea or elsewhere in uh, Korea. Is, is my favorite because it's cheapest in Korea mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or elsewhere, you know, in Asia. I mean, wouldn't it be better for Hawaii if Matson, for example, uh, spent one-fifth of the cost of a new ship when it buys a new ship? Because then it wouldn't have to amortize that cost against us and pass it on to us. So uh, from that point of view alone, wouldn't it be a good idea to get us exempted? And, and why is the, the delegation not doing that? Yeah, I guess because of the home rules con concept, and they want to make sure that uh, you're protecting the uh, American industry in terms of uh, manufacturing. There's uh, no industry the, here, though. There are no shipyards here mm -hmm. I mean, that are building these ocean-going ships. Yeah, exactly. Only uh, the U.S. Navy has a shipyard here, so that's only for military Navy. and uh, military purposes. But uh, yeah. in terms of commercial, uh, we have to either go to San Diego or in Seattle. They have so uh, we don't benefit by by you know the union, uh, the benefits to the unions and the benefits to shipyard owners under the Jones Act, American shipyard owners and American union. We mm -hmm. don't benefit for that at all, but we have to pay the price mm -hmm. um, of having these expensive ships because we, we the, the amortization. Yeah, that's why, that's why a lot of the, if you go to the supermarket over here, you look at the retail price, I would say compared to the mainland uh, grocery stores, you compare like the milk or orange juice or whatever, pro, or the meat that you we consume here, uh, I would say six to eight percent of difference because we're paying like six to eight percent in transportation costs, and uh, which you know if you're in the mainland, uh, a lot of you might get a lot of these stuff a lot yeah. cheaper. Yeah, <coughs> I mean, it really there was a, a no, just an, another survey indicating that this was a very hard place to get a job, uh, relatively speaking, and very hard. It's a hard economy for people, and it's a hard place to buy things because you, your wages aren't enough to pay for the high cost of living. And this, you know, this is really a recipe for backwater. But let me, let me go to one other question I think we should address, and that is uh, what can Hawaii do, aside from the Jones Act now, to improve the possibilities for import-export? And you mentioned before the show, we were, we were talking before the show, that we have a foreign, a foreign uh, trade zone which plays into import-export. It's a big thing. Um, and right after this break, Russell, I'd like to talk about how that works and what, if anything, the state of Hawaii can do, you and me and our elected officials can do to facilitate better import-export by, by improving our transportation facilities with the State Department of Transportation, for example, uh, at the foreign trade zone or otherwise in order to improve the prospects for 
trade and our economy. Let's take a short break. We'll come back and then see what Russell says. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we'll tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better, a try a little more, hard on everyone. Uh, welcome back to Think Tech, and more specifically, welcome back to Leadership in Hawaii. Today we're talking about... Uh, we're talking about trade. Uh, we're talking about transportation and trade. We're talking about import-export for Hawaii. Uh, we're talking to Russell Hanma. He's a U.S. Uh, senior official for APEC Hawaii. Uh, and he thinks globally. And so if I ask you that question, you know, what could you offer me? We have a foreign trade mm -hmm. zone. First, tell me how it works. I mean, you know, in terms of foreign trade, I know that our biggest one is that foreign trade zone nine that we seen by uh right next to the Homeland Security Office, but immigration is uh, right behind on the, there's a foreign trade zone office that the State Department, Economic De uh, Department of Business and Tourism, DBED operate, and it's under the state jurisdiction, but they do work with the United States U.S. Customs or with the uh, U.S. Customs Border Protection Agency, which they changed the name in 2003, and uh, so that's under the Homeland Security with uh, we have our immigration there, services, as well as U.S. Customs and Border Patrol uh, uh, Agency. Mm -hmm. And that plays a major role in terms of uh, customs regulation. How does it work? I mean, what, what uh, does in it do with trade the zone, like, it's zone. like, uh, I'll sell a good example. Like, uh, it's an area that you designate it. And if you know, like, a similar from a state level, like uh, state enterprise zone, which is a similar kind of concept, but you, you don't pay state taxes. But in foreign trade zone, you don't take, you don't pay federal taxes, like in terms of U.S. Customs. import, customs yeah, tax, yeah, yeah. tariffs when it's, you're paying for the importing goods coming from it's foreign countries. Safe country. haven, a sanctuary. Exactly. It's a, it's a neutral zone. As well, long as you do conduct business in this foreign trade zone area, it's an area that's designated as a free trade area, as a free trade zone. So I can bring goods in, I can leave them there. And I can ship them out again, and there's no federal tax effect at all. Yes, as uh, long as you have the legal documents to justify that. Like, it's similar to like uh, what freight forwarders do in terms of a warehouse entry. Like, you want to bring it in, and you want to just store it there and uh, re-export it out. And you don't have to pay any tariffs or anything, maybe some fees for our service fee. But in this case, in foreign trade zone, what you can do is a good example is what we used to do at the foreign uh, trade Zone 9. I don't know if they're doing this now, but uh, in the past, in the 80s, or what they used to, they used to bring apples for New Zealand. And in New Zealand, apples would be converted in, into apple juice, and they'll can it and so everything. Actually doing manufacturing process. Manufacturing process, process the, the food zone. processing area. And then what you do is after you have the finished product, you can re-export it out without paying Without anything. ever sort of touching this exactly. economy. Exactly, yeah, even you bring in the, uh, the apples coming in from New Zealand. And a lot of people do that, like I know like Panasonic uh, used to have a, a foreign trade zone in the Paia area. And that's where the uh, diagnostic the laboratory is with the blood bank. Uh, but that used to be a foreign trade zone for Panasonic. So what they used to do is they used to bring in uh, parts and material from Japan and they'll assemble it there by using a local labor force in terms of manufacturing, and uh, then after they have their finished product, they can re-export it out and without paying any okay, tariffs. As soon as you cross the gate, so to speak, as soon as you leave the foreign trade zone and so come into Honolulu or IAEA, whatever the case may be, bingo, now you're subject to American customs, tariffs, what have you, right? Right. I mean, you can, you know, and then you have a choice, you can either based on whatever, you know, freight forwarders use, like a foreign uh, warehouse entry is a good example, like foreign trade zone, where you can export it, uh, import it, release some of the goods that you want it for local domestic consumption. In other words, you want to have that finished product like uh, apple juice, and you want it to sell it 
in Long's or Safeway or Time Supermarket or a Food Land that you can, whatever apples juice that comes out, you got to pay taxes on that Right, portion. but you don't have to pay taxes on the difference between the apples and the juice. Exactly. Because exactly. juice is more valuable than apples. Exactly. So that manufacturing process is essentially not taxed, mm -hmm. not exactly. by a tariff yeah. anyway. Well, long as, uh, long as you're, you're operating in that bonded kind of uh, area. Yeah. And uh, another good example is uh, duty-free shoppers in Waikiki at How's the airport. That yeah. That is a foreign trade zone too. But and the got store is a foreign store, trade zone? For, the store itself is a duty-free. So whatever, you know, whiskeys or high fashion merchandise that you see over there, uh, you don't have to pay tariffs as long as taxes on a sales tax, because well, this is a foreign and trade who zone. who decides this? Well, actually, you got to get a license. And uh, like foreign trade, you got to have one U.S. Customs uh, uh, broker uh, official there uh, working there to manage the uh, uh, Make sure foreign, there's no foreign funny trade business. zone. Exactly. Waikiki Gallery at the duty-free shoppers is a foreign trade zone there, too. Mm -hmm. you know, I think depending on the which floor, second or third So it can be a little floor. thing. It can be a big, doesn't have to have a fence around it. It doesn't have to have barbed wire or security guards. It can be a shop. Yeah, exactly. Like duty-free right, shoppers. Exactly. And, huh. you know, it gives an incentive uh, for, uh, you know, that, to me, that kind of creates a little bit of win-win kind of situation. Yeah, so what happens with duty-free shoppers? I mean, everybody likes to shop there because it's cheap. I mean, I shouldn't say everybody. It's the Japanese tourists, isn't it? It's well, not me. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I go in there, I'm not going to get a break. But they get a break, right? Yeah, uh, yeah they, they got to show their passport, and they, they, they go to the area where they have a, 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 a foreign, like a duty-free merchandise are laid out. And there's an area there for locals can go there, too, and shop and pay their general tax. They, they got to pay the yeah, tax. Exactly. The Japanese tourists or whoever, whatever kind of tourist. Um, they don't have to pay the yeah, tax. Yeah, as long as they're it's showing. It's treated as if this transaction did not take place in, in the U.S. Right, right. So if you go all over the world, uh, duty free shoppers have uh, some kind of outlet at the international airports throughout the country or throughout worldwide. So uh, that gives, uh, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, that was a good thing. Because uh, uh, nowadays there's so much competition that merchandising and products. Uh, it's all over, you know, you can get it, you can probably get it in a wholesale price anywhere practically. Okay, oh. so here's the magic question oh. for you. You know, Russell, you're into trade. You're, you know, the U.S. senior official for APEC, which is all about commerce and economic development. Um, and um, that's what you think about. That's what you do. That's your orientation. Uh, you would like to see as much trade uh, between this country and other countries as is possible. You would like to see the Trans-Pacific Partnership succeed. You would like to see us part of it. And um, I guess it's, it's beneficial, as far as your view of it is concerned, for us to have uh, foreign trade zones, because that's commerce and import, export, trade, and whatnot. So my question to you is, what can the state of Hawaii do okay, to improve its economy by way of this transportation aspect, foreign trade zones or otherwise? Um, you know, what, what do we do to get in on the benefits of import-export or to increase our import-export activities uh, because of transportation mm -hmm. or the way we, we handle mm -hmm. uh, import-export through, through any mechanism at all? And, uh, well, what do we do and can we, in fact, do it? Yeah, I think it's already being done. You know, it's moving. I remember that if you look at the numbers statistically, from year 2004 to year 2014, within that 10-year span, we must uh, uh, quadruple the exporting of, of uh, Hawaii uh, merchandise. And roughly right now, we have about over 840 uh, Hawaii companies who are engaged in exporting of their services or their product. And Hawaii alone, we generate roughly about $1.5 billion in export. What are we exporting? Uh, most of them were, could be fruits, uh, could be uh, finished products that we bring in, uh, uh, woodwork, uh, cabinet kind of arts things. Arts and crafts, yeah, trade, and crafts, tourist items. And some of the uh, uh, other energy products that we come up with. Uh, so there is a market coming up, uh, you know, in terms not only for uh, we export tourism as well. That mm -hmm. Those numbers in there, I know like two years ago, uh, Hawaii Tourism Authority won that export e-commerce uh, award from the president 
through the White House and became one of the uh, uh, tourist destinations in the for? world. What was that for? That's for exporting uh, uh, tourism. And oh, through tourism is treated as an export. Yes, and those numbers are in there. And that's why I was saying in Hawaii, one out of five people are working in the import export trade related industry here well, if you and if you look at the numbers I, uh, I would say we have like 1.4 million people in population in Hawaii out of that 208,000 people are in the uh, import export trade related uh, uh, industry okay in well you've, you've said that we have increased our import export uh, with, with that and other thing, and in other mind. things is, uh, and to me if you want to expand on the business uh, I would like to see more training company here, more entrepreneurs that want to go into freight forwarders that want to go and engage in import more of export people. helping these businesses how to do uh, import export. Yeah, it's not magic. How do yeah. you do that? You get a license? Uh, actually, you know, if you, you, know, you all you had need is a general exercise class uh, to do business, and you can uh, hire uh, freight forwarders to do the trading for you, and as long as you give them the shipping request who your consignee and the shipper is, in other words, who the buyer and the seller is, and you become like the middleman. And uh, right now, nowadays, you, there's so much opportunity with the internet, with the uh, uh, interstate commerce and all that. Uh, uh, you can buy a merchandise and wholesale on the internet, and you can do the shipping right there, and you, you, you act as an agent. Ship to Asia. And, and ship it to ship Asia. American and, anyway, to Europe, Asia. all over the world. And uh, So I, what you're saying, I think I hear what you're saying is you, you're taking goods that are manufactured on the mainland, U.S. mainland, and you're selling them to Asia. You're an exporter, uh, effectively, um, and uh, you operate from Hawaii. And the goods don't actually necessarily have to actually come through Hawaii. Exactly, because you already they have their own little shipping department you're, you're over a there. Broker. Exactly. So, so you why, why is it better to do that here than in California? Actually, you, anywhere. It doesn't have to be in California. You can be anywhere and do that. As uh, long as you, you can uh, have your, your site and uh, through the website. Well, and what, I, the, what I hear and you saying is that somebody who can build a website, somebody who can understand this process you've been describing, can be here, live on the beach, whatnot, okay, and engage in a profitable mm -hmm. import-export mm -hmm. business, mostly export, of American goods to Asia, and possibly versa, vice versa. Uh, tell them, tell, tell, tell the entrepreneurs, tell the young people what their options are, and that's what we need to impart to them. Yeah, I would like to tell you, what, when, when I first started uh, doing import-export, uh, there was no internet, there was no e-commerce or eBay or anything where you can buy things on a wholesale and, and sell at retail. So we all have to represent a company and ask the company to be your company rep and get a sample of the product or service that you're selling. And we have to take that sample to overseas. Like I remember I was doing on this uh, business with uh, Hard Rock Cafe in Japan, and I was representing company in New York, and we're bringing a lot of these uh, leather jackets from Hard Cafe t-shirts and put it in, the, in Japan's Hard Rock Cafe, and I was the one that was doing the transaction. And, uh, and I got into uh, surfboards and skateboards and represent this company called Action East, and uh, it was like a generic kind of, uh, but uh, you know, there's all these ways that you can approach in an in, uh, entrepreneurial kind of way. So as long as you have your, uh, un you got to understand the import-export transportation operation and uh, understand what freight forwarders and uh, uh, U.S. customs brokers as well, the trading company operate. You yourself can operate as a trading company. Even I can do that, you know, with my uh, iPhone or, you know, in terms that sure. it's just a way of uh, nowadays with the, you know, technology that's out there, uh, everything's uh, capable nowadays. Yeah, and, and your advantage over, for example, somebody who lives in China who could read the same internet and could read the same laws about freight forwarding, your advantage is that you know the arbitrage. You know what we have here and what they don't have there and how to make you know a buck on satisfying that demand with what we have in the way of supply. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the notion to me of import-export, finding out what we got here that they don't have there. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you can do that, but I think you have to travel, don't right. you? You have uh, to travel. The thing is that uh, if you can attend a lot of these trade shows and uh, depending on what kind of commodities or business that you want to engage in, if it's a gift item kind of trade show, it could be electronic products or something that's unique that you think there's a marketplace. And you go, you attend those trade shows and you, you talk to those manufacturers rep 
and uh, give some information and ask him if you want to be your manufacturer rep. How much is a wholesale? If you can buy it in a wholesale price or X factory below price, then you know there's a markup fee for retail. So as yourself being an intermediator, like a trading company broker, you want to get the, you want to be good to the supplier and see if you can get the best price to the supplier. Then you have the customer, the buyer on the other side. You got to be good to them as well and see what they're looking for. So you got to kind of play both sides. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you have to think globally. Exactly. You have to think globally. You have to see that you know, the, the possibility of the market uh, and the supply and demand curve and opportunity, and then you can make a buck. And uh, just to close, I mean, I've, you know, in the past, we had more of this than we had now. For some reason, am I right? It's diminished, and we have to rebuild that if we want to be uh, the crossroads of the Pacific uh, economically and in terms of trade and import-export, right? Yeah, I guess in terms of rulemaking, you know, like I remember when I was being an advocate for pushing that multi-trade agreement for the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, so-called TPP, and I wanted to make Hawaii the headquarters because we can apply the uh, American law here with due diligence and with, with, with uh, the international rule of law. And based on the policy side, we have it set, then we can move the private sector and uh, people to follow and create the business opportunity. So it gives a lot of chance to uh, a fair deal or you know, making the playing grounds more yeah. equal in that way. Great oh. and interesting way to earn a living too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Russell. Russell Hanma. Yeah, thank you, Jay. You're a senior trade official for Apex Hawaii. Thank you.